Hi, welcome to today's video. My name is Lauren Smith and I'm a theoretical physics student in Trinity College Dublin. Today I'll take you through 2021's higher level question 6. This question is the typical multiple choice question you see every year. You answer 8 out of the 12 parts, but I would recommend to do all of them. So, let's get started. Just before we begin parts A and B of our question, I'd like to draw your attention to page 50 of the formula and tables book. In particular, at the formulas V equals U plus AT and S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared under linear motion with constant acceleration. In part A, we're asked to define acceleration and to also from that derive V equals U plus AT. Now, in order to define acceleration, you can either use the verbal or the mathematical notation or a little bit of both, whichever suits you. For those of you who prefer verbal notation, acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. For those of you like me who are a little bit more mathematically inclined, you state the formula, A is equal to V minus U over T. This is the change in velocity over time. You're explaining the formula. And also you're going to notate, i.e. label your variables. I personally prefer mathematical notation purely in a practical sense because it just takes a lot less time to write out if you can whip those formulas out. If you can, verbal notation is fine, whichever suits. For either definition, you will get three marks. However, if you know the formula by heart, which you will do because you need to learn this formula in order to derive the next expression, it is very handy to use mathematical notation. Stating this formula, which you will need to use, will get you two marks. On to the derivation. Basically what you do here, you can just manipulate the formula, multiplying across both sides by t, adding u or the initial velocity to both sides, and we obtain the same expression as is required. Showing all necessary steps, you get your final two marks. For part B, we are told that a ball is kicked with an initial velocity of magnitude 20 meters per second at an angle of 50 degrees to the horizontal. The horizontal distance travels in 1.2 seconds. And we're given a little diagram over here showcasing the projectile, i.e. the ball. So we're given the magnitude of the initial velocity and we are given the time and we're also giving the direction of the velocity. Velocity is in fact a vector quantity and in order to calculate the horizontal distance we will need to decompose this um, magnitude of the velocity into its directional components or its vector components. So what is the velocity in the x direction or the horizontal direction and the vertical direction, which we would normally denote as the y direction in Cartesian coordinates. So I have a triangle here to the left where we can visualize how to decompose this magnitude into its vector components. And I would always recommend as a top tip to draw out diagrams, especially for vectors. So we're looking at the horizontal velocity, which is this red squiggle over here on the triangle. And this represents the adjacent of this velocity triangle. And through trigonometric identities, we know that the horizontal speed is equal to 20, the hypotenuse, times the cosine of the angle. And the cosine of the angle, and this angle in here, is in degrees. So make sure your calculator is in degrees mode. Evaluating this, we turn to the calculator, giving us a horizontal velocity of 12.86 meters per second, giving us two marks. We have the horizontal speed, we have the time. How do we find the horizontal distance? By definition, and you can see here in the schematic to the top right, you can imagine the projectile its only acceleration is in the vertical direction. It's only influenced by gravity, which is normally denoted by G. But we have no horizontal acceleration. So the horizontal acceleration is just zero. And we can find a formula that fits all of the information we have in order to calculate the horizontal distance. Namely, S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared. We would like 
the horizontal distance, i.e. in the x direction, by convention. Now we have the horizontal velocity in the x direction, which I've denoted as u sub x, multiplied by the time, and we have no acceleration component, so therefore the second term over here vanishes. Being able to set up this formula, you can always look at your projectile motion topics. You'll be able to get this for three marks. We have all of our values. Now we can just sub them in and get our horizontal distance. I've rounded when I've subbed in, in my workings, the horizontal velocity. However, in the calculator, I've kept it as one full number. I've stored it. I've kept it up on screen. So that when I sub in and want to find my horizontal distance, we're given the full decimal value and I don't have to write it out all again. So giving us our final answer, 15.43 meters. Not forgetting your units, you get your final two marks. Part C, state the laws of equilibrium for a set of coplanar forces. Coplanar basically means that the forces all occur in the same plane, i.e. a two-dimensional plane, for example. Equilibrium means balanced. So these laws have to concern with balancing forces and torques and moments and all such. So law one states that the sum of the forces in any direction is zero. So we're looking at translational forces here, maybe going up and down. Forces up equal forces down, left forces equal right forces and so forth. Your first correctly stated law will give you your first four marks. Now looking at the more rotational forces inside of things, like your moments, your torques, law two states that the sum of the motions about any axis is also zero. So anti-clockwise moments equals clockwise moments, and we're going to get a balanced rotating system. Three marks. Before moving on to part D, I'd like to draw your attention to page 56 of the Formula and Tables book of the acceleration due to gravity formula. In part D, we are asked to state an expression for the acceleration due to gravity at a distance of 2r over the so surface of a planet of mass m and radius r. Make sure to highlight all of that relevant information that we might use in our formulas. So because we're asked for the acceleration due to gravity, it makes sense to use the formula, which I showed you in the Foreman Tables book under that exact name. Just stating this formula and copying it directly from the formula tables book, not having to learn it off at all, which is just really handy marks, by the way, you will get four out of your seven marks for this part of the question. So it is worth, and this is a big recommendation from me to you, please write down as many formulas as you can. You will pick up marks like there's no tomorrow. Now, how to adapt this formula to the question, you can look at the diagram I've drawn to the left and we're looking at this kind of purple particle at the top here and it is a distance of 2r above the surface of the planet. Now in this formula, d is measured from the centre of mass of this particle or the point that we're measuring above the surface to the centre of the planet i.e. the centre of mass of the planet. It's normally concentrated in the centre of the planet, especially if it's a round planet, which we're assuming. So from the diagram here, it's obvious that d is equal to 3 times the radius. Putting this into our formula, and we're going to square the denominator in order to just tidy up our expression, giving us a final answer of g is equal to, capital G, m over 9 or squared three marks. Part E, we are told that two different types of thermometer can give different readings when placed in the same environment and we're asked to explain why this happens. Your answer will be as follows and this is for the full seven marks and how you get those seven marks is by explaining this phrase here. Different thermometric properties in general scale temperature readings differently to one another. Part F, we're moving on to another topic, which is the topic of sound now. And we're asked to draw a labelled diagram to represent the second harmonic of a stationary wave in an open pipe. Because it is an open pipe, we're going to have to have two antinodes at the end. It wouldn't even make sense. And even when drawing this, if you try drawing a pipe open at both ends and you try to draw a node, which is this thing here at the end, it just wouldn't look right. 
So your configuration is anti-node, node, node, anti-node, because we are looking at one full wavelength for the second harmonic. We know that measuring from an anti-node to a node is going to be a quarter of a wavelength. Not forgetting, which is why I left it out to highlight this, you also have an anti-node in here. Where do you get your marks? You get four marks for having an anti-node at each end and for having one full wavelength, which is what you can see here, you get your three marks. Now moving on to part G, we're asked to calculate the sound intensity six meters from a loudspeaker, which is going to be our source of power 20 milliwatts. The formula that we are going to use is intensity is equal to power over area. This formula is not in the formula in tables book, so beware. 99% of the formulas that you will need in this physics exam will be in the formula in tables book, but make sure to learn the few that are not in this book because you will require them. How do we solve this? Well, we know the power to be equal to 20 milliwatts. We need to convert this into SI units, which gives us 20 times 10 to the power of minus 3 watts. You can simplify this in your calculator. To find the intensity, we also need the area. And we can figure out what this area is by looking at the diagram to the right of me. I've only been able to draw it in 2D. That part is out of my control. But we have that the loudspeaker is at the source, which is at this point here. And at the other purple spot, which I'm highlighting over, which is six meters away from the center of this circle, that is where we need to measure the sound intensity. Sound waves, it looks on the two-dimensional plane that these are coming at the source in circles. In a 3D perspective, they're coming at you in spherical spheres, in spherical shells. So the area or the surface area of a sphere is what we need to measure. And we know that the surface area of a sphere is equal to four pi or squared, meters squared, that's the units, where or is the radius of these spheres. And the spheres have radius in this case of six meters because that, and you can see pretty clearly why that is the case from the diagram, which is always really important to keep drawing your diagrams. You can visualize it a lot better under pressure. And you can just sub in your value for the radius here. Bear in mind, stating this formula will get you three marks. Moving on to the calculation. We can now put everything into our calculator. By the way, in cases like this, where you don't necessarily know what the units for sound intensity are, input them into the formula, and then whatever your final answer will be, it should match the units. Putting this all into our calculator, being extremely careful with our scientific notation, which is why I kept it in. And also be very careful of your indices as well. And this is our sound intensity rounding to two significant figures and noticing that our final units are watts per meters squared not forgetting our units our expression for the area will give us two marks and our final two marks are given for our answer part h we're asked to list two primary colors of light and from this we are to determine what color of light is produced when equal intensities of these two primary colors are mixed. And I've drawn out kind of a table. So we have three primary colors, red, blue, and green, and therefore there are three combinations of these two. So stating any two of these will get you two marks per primary color. So we're gonna get, say for the first one, two marks for the red and two marks for stating blue. And I've drawn out a table here showing our primary color combinations and what you get when you mix these colors. You get two marks for stating one primary color. So in this case for the red and blue, you get two marks for red and two marks for blue. And when they're mixed, they make magenta, giving you three marks. I included all possible combinations here so you can maybe review them yourself and look over them. But you only need to state one such set of primary color combinations and their mixed one. But in an exam, if you know them all, put them all down. Because if you get one of them wrong, the right ones will be picked. Part I, we are asked to distinguish between earthing and bonding in domestic electricity. The definitions are as follows. 
earthing is providing a conducting path to the earth between two conductors, the other conductor being the earth itself. Bonding means providing a conducting path between objects, one of which is not the earth. Your first correct statement will get you four marks. The second correct statement will get you three marks. Before diving into part J, I'd like to draw your attention to pages 72 to 78 of the Foreman Tables book, which are of great use when drawing out circuit diagrams. And today we shall be looking at page 75 in particular, and at the circuit symbols for a diode, a voltmeter, and an ammeter. In part J, we're asked to draw a circuit diagram to show how voltage and current are measured for diode in reverse bias. The keywords here being that the diode is in reverse bias and we need to show how voltage and current are measured. So we know that these three things will be the basis or the majority for our marks. So before I go into the arrangement of the diode, let's look at how voltage and current are arranged in a circuit. I've drawn in a random voltage source, as you can see here. It can be any potential difference value, but I've got 20 volts here. So we'll need this as a reference source as to how we are to arrange the ammeter and the voltmeter. So starting with the voltmeter, the voltmeter in a circuit diagram is always in parallel with the voltage source. Basically what in parallel means is that if you were to remove that component from the circuit, it would still not be broken. And for a series, like the ammeter, as you can see here, the opposite applies. Ammeters are always in series with the voltage source. So if you can imagine a current going through the ammeter, which is what it needs to do in order to measure the current, that's the whole purpose of an ammeter. It will need it to go in series. So we're going to give two marks for the voltmeter and we're going to give two marks for the correct arrangement of the ammeter as well. Now into the diode. For diode and reverse bias, there is no current running through the circuit. So the conventional current flow of the diode must be in the opposite direction to that in the power source, as I've drawn here. Current in the conventional sense flows from the positive to the negative terminal of a battery. So if we have a current I here, or in the case of a diode from the anode to the cathode. And as you can see here, the positive terminal of the battery is connected to the negative terminal of the diode and the negative terminal of the battery is connected to the positive term of the diode and therefore chosen the reverse bias. And this also means that no current will flow through the circuit. This correct arrangement will give you your final three marks. Before moving on to part K, I'd like to draw your attention to page 79 of the Formian Tables book, where we are looking at the periodic table of elements. The elements that we will look at in particular today will be carbon and nitrogen. In part K, we are told that carbon-14, which is an isotope of carbon, because carbon in the periodic table is carbon-12, so they have different numbers of neutrons. Therefore, it undergoes nuclear decay. The daughter nucleus is nitrogen-14, and we're asked to write a nuclear equation for this decay. And this is why I highlighted the Formian Tables book. We are told that carbon-14, which has six protons, we are told that carbon-14, an isotope of carbon, decays to a daughter nucleus of nitrogen-14 plus something else, right? And the reason why we have another thing here is because we have to make sure that our protons, i.e. our atomic numbers, all sync up. So carbon-14, an isotope of carbon, it has six protons. That is its atomic number, as you can see in the periodic table. Nitrogen-14 in the periodic table has an atomic number of seven. Therefore, in order for this equation to be balanced, we need a minus one, which is where this electron comes in, the beta particle, because this is undergoing beta decay. This formula in its entirety will get you your full seven marks. Part L, our final part, we are asked to distinguish between a moderator and a control rod in terms of how they interact with the neutrons in a fission reactor. It's very simple. The moderator slows down the neutrons and the control rod absorbs the neutrons. How a moderator interacts with the neutrons Stating it correctly will get you the four marks. How the control rod interacts with the neutrons will get you your final three marks. And there we are done the question.